By my third marathon, I was the ninth fastest woman ever in Canada. Put a bid in for the 2012 Olympics, got denied. Was told that I was just a flash in the pan, that I wasn't a rising star in the sport. And so then less than 18 months later, I came back and ran national record, broke a 28 year old record of being the fastest woman in Canada. Hi, and welcome to the Awakening Series. My name is Kimberly Archuleta. Today we have a brilliant mind, an amazing athlete, and a friend. I'm so thankful and honored to have Lanny Marchette on the call. Lanny is an Olympian. She is a Canadian. She was the fastest woman in Canada for quite some time. And I'm really excited to talk about her journey. Lanny, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for your time today on this freezing cold day in Denver. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for having me. Awesome. Lanny, can you give us some insight about your upbringing? So as you mentioned, I'm from Canada. I'm from London, Ontario, Canada. I'm one of seven kids. So there's four sisters and two brothers, primarily raised by my mom. We all have the same dad. We just unfortunately had a father that struggled with some addiction and mental health issues. So when I say primarily by my mom, she kind of held down the fort and my dad was there in whatever capacity he was able to be. And so you being the middle child in the family, how of seven, I mean, that's insane. <laughs> how did you become the fastest woman in Canada. That's phenomenal. I didn't really intend for that to happen. I actually grew up, we grew up as a figure skating family and my older sister was destined to be the Olympic athlete of the family. And when that didn't happen, that dream kind of went away with, with her dreams. And then I kept run. I was always running because of skating. We always got, if you got in trouble, you had to run laps around the parking lot. And it got to the point where I was like, I would rather run these laps than go on the ice. <laughs> and it was soon into my high school career that I realized you get a scholarship to the U.S. So running was kind of always either punishment or a means to an end. It got me a scholarship to the U.S. Uh, I went ran at University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. And then I kept running through law school. I have two law degrees. And I realized pretty soon into my legal studies that I was a much better student if I kept running and trying to compete in some capacity. And I was just good enough to win some money on the roads during road races. So I'd buy my books or my groceries. And then I started practicing law and got talked into doing a marathon, then doing another. And then by my third marathon, I was the ninth fastest woman ever in Canada. Put a bid in for the 2012 Olympics, got denied was told that I was just a flash in the pan, that I wasn't a rising star in the sport. And so then less than 18 months later, I came back and ran national record, broke a 28 year old record and became the fastest woman in Canada. But it wasn't ever something that I set out to do, but it's definitely something I'm uh, quite proud of and an accomplishment that obviously put me on the map of international road running. This story is phenomenal. Like middle child of seven figure skating family, getting a scholarship to, you know, the U S to Chattanooga university of Tennessee. I mean, the whole story of you just not winning at first, but trying and trying and trying, and then actually becoming the fastest woman in Canada is insane. Like this is one of the coolest, like an athlete stories ever. I, we should do like a, a movie. There should be a movie based on your life. Can you just give us some insight about that day when you were accepted to the Olympics? 2016, I got to go and represent Canada in two events at the Olympics, but not without its own trials and tribulations. Much like 2012, I almost didn't get to go. They tried to tell me I had to pick one event or I wouldn't get to go at all. There was a lot of back and forth with the head coach of Athletics Canada at the time. A huge campaign started, let Lanny run both. And I finally, I found out with everybody else that I was, I was going to get to be an Olympian and get to do both events. They had the announcement ceremony. We're all there in our Team Canada jackets and they announced me for both events and that's kind of when I realized it was real, that all of those years of laps around the parking lot as a figure skater, all of those, run all the years running in university and through law school and not walking away in 2012 when they told me I wasn't good enough. That's what 20, that final announcement, make, naming me to the Team Canada Olympic team after 
staying in the sport when they basically told me I had no business to be here was a huge moment for me. And then obviously competing at the games was its own major moment. I, I have so many things to unpack there. My gosh. Well, congratulations again. I'm just so wowed by you and enamored by your just dedication to the passion and to just not giving up. So as far as, as your routine, if you can give us some insight about your actual routine to becoming an Olympian, like, what is that like? Is it just like nonstop all day, every day? <laughs> I mean, you have, um, you're an attorney. I mean, what, how, how much time do you have? <laughs> right. So I left full-time in-person practice in 2013. So I've been remote since 2013. I still maintained my legal career and my legal practice. I always say that post pandemic, it's a lot easier now because there's a lot more platforms that allow you to be remote, but I was doing it when I would have to find fax machines and track down ways to send and FedEx files down to the court. But my days usually back then and then still now are pretty much set up into two training blocks. I always train in the morning, get a, try to get most of my mileage in in the morning usually a strength session or some kind of mobility session. And then the second training block usually is a bit shorter, a bit lighter. It's more about recovery and just time on my legs. And that time in between, a lot of my colleagues and competitors nap or rest. I usually, that's when my work hours are. So in the middle of my day is when I'm trying to do any legal work, answer emails, post, post on social media, because a lot of my sponsorships and endorsements require that. So that middle part of my day is usually pretty jam-packed, do my evening session, grab some food, try and chill with my dog and just relax and rinse, recycle, repeat. That's phenomenal. That's, that's an, an Olympian's, like a full-time woman who is an Olympian's routine. Wow. Are you comp- like looking to compete in another marathon or like what's your next endeavor, I guess, in regards to this sport? Yeah, so I, after the 2016 Olympics, unfortunately hit a pretty big slump. My dad, who I mentioned earlier, passed away of an overdose right after Christmas, just before New Year's of 2016. I had kidney surgery in 2017 that resulted in me going septic. So I was in the hospital for eight days. I didn't realize how serious sepsis is until after the fact, I found out that a lot of people aren't as lucky as me. They don't get to come back from it and come out of it let alone continue to pursue their passion in sport. 2018, I had hip surgery to repair a f- almost fully detached labrum and a bunch of other things, nerve impingement, all of it. 2019, I had abdominal surgery. And then 2020 was the pandemic. So I had a good solid four years there where the world just seemed kind of like it was stacked against me a little bit. 2021, unfortunately, didn't start out much smoother. I found one of my good friends succumb to an overdose here in Denver. So that kind of derailed as anyone knows, or anyone who follows a summer Olympic sport, the 2020 Olympics were pushed to 2021. So initially we thought, great, I have an extra year. I can try to make that team. But then spring of 2021 is when I found my friend passed away in his apartment. So I withdrew from the Olympic trials and kind of thought at that point, I was done with this sport, but after battling so many injuries and surgeries and so much loss, and maybe the universe was telling me it was time to walk away. But then there was a part of me that was like, you know what, why don't you reframe it and run for people who think that that bad moment is the last moment that they get to try. But like, and my whole thing is I, no matter how painful the marathon can get now, I'm going to make sure I cross the finish line for those who don't, for those who gave up that moment too soon, those who sought other avenues, drugs, alcohol, et cetera, to numb whatever they're going through. So I did New York City Marathon, November, 2021. That was my first marathon in five years. And I ended up, I think I ended up 11th in the the professional field, ran a minute faster than I ran on that course five years previous. And then six weeks later, one Honolulu marathon raced all, all spring 2022. And then unfortunately this summer injured my foot. So I'm rehabbing that back, but the goal is to try and make it to Paris 2024. So I know I still have some good racing in me 
And I know with this new mindset of what I'm racing for and who I'm racing for, there's so many more opportunities out there for me. I, I've not come to a point where in any interview where I've had so much emotion. I mean, I could <laughs> feel your emotion and I'm just so thankful that you're running for such a good cause. Like so thankful. And I think this interview will really help people see like what people strive for, like great people, great minds, great athletes. I mean, it's an elite mindset and you have it. And I'm just so thankful for you. You know, thank you so much for doing what you do and all the work you do behind it, like the routine, your normal job, like the endorsements and such. So getting back onto, I guess, the endorsements, how does that work out? Like when you say, for example, uh, broke the the record for the Canadian marathon, like, do you like instantly get called and, you know, do endorsements come in? How does that, how does that all work for, for us folks that didn't make it? (laughs) I wish it was as easy as that. I, I was at the time running for one shoe company. It was just gear and a few bonuses. After I set that record, there was other companies interested. So we kind of shopped around and tried to find a company that I was happy to endorse and that we thought was a good partnership. So that was ASICS. I was with ASICS from 2014 through halfway through 2017. I wish that professional running paid the same as other professional sports. It doesn't. Our contracts are substantially smaller and it's kind of performed to be paid or don't. So anytime you're sick or injured or have a bad day, yeah, it's not like other sports where they're paid whether you sit on the bench or not. After the 2016 games, I switched to Under Armour and I was with Under Armour through second half of 2017 up until spring of 2017, or sorry, spring of 2021. And we were in renegotiations, but that's right when I found my friend and I kind of just needed to take a step back and just needed space from all things running and all things, everything that I just had been fighting for so long. And that morning was just such a traumatic experience that it made me pause and go, I don't even think, I don't even know if I like doing this anymore. I don't want to be on a contract with a company where I'm forced to continue to do it. So now, right now I'm currently unsponsored in terms of a shoe company brand. What it's allowed me to do though, is pick and choose and wear different shoes or different gear and get companies to kind of endorse me for that one single event or a series of events. So it's allowing me to have a bit more fun. It doesn't get the same financial security (laughs) that you do when you have a set contract, but it's at least letting me do it on my own terms. And that's really important to me. And other ways that we get paid in professional running is appearance fees, prize money at the finish line and time bonuses, et cetera. So there's kind of two avenues or two revenue streams there. And again, it's really just determinant on how fast my body is going to take me that day. As far as being an Olympian, when you were actually at the Olympics, like how, how did, I mean, just give us some, like the first day, the second day, the last day, how did you fare? It is intense when you first get there because everyone's still competing. And then each day, different set of athletes are done with their competition. So you can kind of see them having a bit more fun. Each country has their own team house. So there's a team Canada house, team Australia house, because your family's not allowed in the village. So if you want to see family and friends, they can go to your country's house. And with your credential, you can usually get into some of the other houses. So you get to socialize that way. Road running is really interesting because I've spent my career competing against international athletes, whether they're American, Australian, French, et cetera, training with them at different training camps. So when you get to the Olympics, it was kind of like a mini reunion in a sense. So a bunch of us went for a shakeout run together because as much as we're competitors, when we're on the track or on the road, we're just friends and you bond over those miles when you're training together. So it was really nice to just have friendly faces and people that I knew even outside of my team, Canada teammates. And then otherwise though, you go to the dining hall and there's Usain Bolt and there's this athlete who's won so many Olympic gold medals and, seeing all the different sizes and the different shapes and knowing that we're all the best at what we do. And for people out there that struggle with body image issue or thinking that they could never succeed and be an Olympic athlete, you just might not be in the right sport. Like it was just so interesting to me. You'd go and there'd be these huge basketball players and wrestlers and tiny gymnasts and divers and swimmers and everyone looks how they need to for their sport. And they're, but they all look vastly different from one another. 
That's amazing. That's such a cool detailed insight about the Olympics and how fun and exciting, but competitive. And also the the bond building, like you mentioned with, uh, you know, running together, it, it just makes me smile because I've always wondered <laughs> what it's like. So thank you for that. A question would be is if, you know, say, for example, you're a bit younger, what, what advice after knowing all that you know now with your running, with your law degree, with you know, the friends that you've lost, what advice would you give your younger self before you started all of this? Oh, man. Um, That's a really good question. I think a big thing that I would tell my my younger self is you don't have to be so hard on yourself to be successful. That one misstep and one failure won't define anything about you or anything about your career. Uh, I grew up in sport and figure skating and running where eating disorders are rampant. And I've definitely had my struggles with it. And I wish I had a better understanding of what a healthy body and a healthy mind can accomplish versus being in the fog of letting my body dysmorphia and my wanting to control my food dictate what I do, whether it's in sport or even socializing. The times that I was so uptight and so had such blinders on thinking I had to do X, Y, and Z to succeed, which meant I missed out on pub nights with my brother and my friends, or I wouldn't wear that bathing suit or that dress because I didn't like how my body looked or felt. And then you go back and look at pictures and you go, you looked fine. Like you were fine. That extra beer wouldn't have harmed anything. And so since 2020 slash 2021, that's very much been my mindset of if I want to eat it, I'm going to eat it. If I want to go for an extra beer, I'm going to have that extra beer. Like Everything is about balance and it's really important to me to be who I am true to my core and let that determine if I'm successful in sport or any other kind of profession I want to enter into. I love it. And thank you. I see that you were um, inducted into the UTC Mox Hall of Fame. What was that like? That's pretty impressive. (laughs) I mean, everything you're talking about is impressive and and, uh, yeah, a little bit more about that would be awesome. No, that was Phenomenal because it showed that I was being recognized for all the hard work I did while I was at UTC and then also thereafter. But again, looking at it through that lens of being so hard on myself, it was really interesting to go back to that campus and go to the ceremony and go out on the basketball court. And I remember so many times being on the dean's list or winning conference or making NCAAs and they parade us out on that basketball court. I never felt proud of it. I never felt like it was good enough versus by the time I was inducted into the Hall of Fame, I'm like, you know what? I've done some really cool things. And maybe not all of them were quite to the level of accomplishment that I hold myself to, but I've done some pretty friggin' cool things. And it's time to start really appreciating and acknowledging that I did work really hard for these things and I am allowed to be proud of them. Absolutely, Lonnie. Oh my goodness, your story again. I'm just so wowed by you. When I first met you, I was like, Who are you, woman? You are amazing. Like, wow. So, if you can give maybe just some, like, the floor is yours, whatever you'd like to tell, you know, maybe the youth or youth, you know, women or athletes or whatever, the floor is yours. I guess I'd say you can change your mind. That was something my mom always said to me when I was a kid. She would preface it as, you're you're a girl, you can change your mind. And I didn't really fully understand what she meant by it, especially by categorizing it as you're a girl. And then as I got older, I realized that we don't, as well in our generation, we weren't offered the same leeway as little girls and women to go go for broke, go after your dreams and passions the same way. It was kind of always like, oh, you, mm, what's your safety net? Do you have a degree? You can have it all, but having it all means family and a good job and this and that and that. I wasn't told I could pursue sport as a profession. I wouldn't change things in terms of having my law degrees, but I really now understand what my mom was saying, that you can change your mind. And it doesn't mean flaking out and it doesn't mean being indecisive. It means go for that goal, but don't blind yourself to just staying on that path for that one goal. My goal my entire life was to go to law school and be an attorney. Had I gone to law school and closed the door on all things running, I wouldn't be an Olympian. I allowed myself to change my mind 
especially I was only in my first year of practice when I decided to go pro running. And that's a big, scary thing. I worked my entire life to be a lawyer. I become a lawyer, get sworn in and eight months later go, are you going to let me work remote? Cause I'm going to peace out and go pursue this running thing. And then the same with the running thing. The goal was always to be an Olympic marathoner. And then I decided to try the 10,000 on the track and I ended up qualifying in that event first actually. <laughs> and I got to do two events at the Olympics. So I guess my the long story short is always allow yourself to change your mind because you never know what opportunities will come to you by just kind of stepping back, looking at the bigger picture and going, I don't know if I want this anymore. I think I want that. And that's actually bigger and better. And I'm going to go for that now. Oh man, that's so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. That definitely hits home. Where can we find you? Like on social media, if people want to follow you. I'm sure a lot of people want to follow you. You have Instagram, Twitter, website. Yeah. So my Instagram is just Lanny Marchant, L-A-N-N-I-M-A-R-C-H-A-N-T. My TikTok's the same. It's just my name. My website's the same. It's just LannyMarchant.com. I have Patreon for people that are interested in more behind the scenes content or getting training programs or just kind of a better glimpse of what my day-to-day life is. And that's just Patreon slash Lanny. I have Twitter. It's just LJM5252. That's because originally when I got Twitter, I was trying to keep it separate from my running and lawyer life. I did want to be found. And now it's such a pain to change my name. (laughs) But yeah, I'm on all social platforms. Even if you just Google Lanny Runner, I'm pretty certain I'm the only one that exists. So you'd be able to find all the information you need about me there. Thank you. And congratulations on all of your amazing success, all that you do. And I'm so excited to see all that you do going forward in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you.